Hey, what's going hey. on? Uh, not much. How you doing? I'm doing. I uh, you, Jay, you'll have to give me a minute here while I'm. I haven't used Zoom yet. I've used everything else. <laughs> <laughs> all good. Are you, good time. Are you getting a video at all? No, not at the moment. There. Let's try this. There it is. Naha. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah every day every day i do an interview it's like uh oh okay i gotta now i gotta download this app now i gotta <laughs> <laughs> you gotta make it hard for you man yeah you know well i'm too, i'm getting too old for that <laughs> <laughs> so how saying, you doing i'm i'm doing good man today's a today's a good day um i'm in california so where are you at uh, I'm in central Illinois, a couple of hours south of Chicago. So it looks um, like you're in a you have like a cabin. Making me jealous. Well, no, this is actually I mean it's a pretty nice basement. Oh, it's a basement. <laughs> yeah, it's a basement. Um my grandpa built this house, so it's oh, got shit. like a full basement in it. And at one point there was actually like a cooking range down here that you know, I mean, it actually had a like a suction chimney unit that went up through the ceiling and everything. Um, that's that's been taken out, but uh, it's a pretty nice basement. My my recording studio is down here, so how's the sound? Sounds, you know, it's a basement. <laughs> <laughs> I have my recording studio in my garage. I don't do like I do parody songs. I'm a comedian, so. Oh, okay. Not, and I always I think it uh, the shittiness of my quality, it, it adds to the joke, you know. Well, what what are uh, what are you recording on? Are you using hard drive, just like Pro Tools and. Um, sometimes Pro Tools. Um, sometimes Audacity. It just depends yeah. what computer I'm I'm using at the time. Yeah. Um, well, and that's that's I I use. Uh, I use logic logic you know yeah um because uh again i'm old <laughs> it's easy you know but but actually we recorded my drums on logic for for the album so i was like and i've been you know kind of fumbling through pro tools and i've used um acid pro and and all, I'm kind of self-taught with that stuff. So, but Audacity, I hear, I hear good things about Audacity. It's pretty cool and cheap. It's free. Yeah. Well, you and that's you can't beat it that free. Yeah. Well, and and Logic for a musician, Logic's actually affordable. <laughs> you know, yeah. which you know, Pro Tools. You start getting into. I mean, I and I I love Pro Tools, but. You know, once you start getting into subscriptions like that, and you know, you get, have to have an eye lock to use it. And, oh yeah. man, that's just too much, too many steps. But. And that's part of the reason why I don't want to go into it because it's just <laughs> I don't want to learn something new. I just want to. Can you just tell my jokes, please? <laughs> can you just record uh, my jokes, please. <laughs> Let me just record my jokes. <laughs> I tell, you know when. In a sense, I kind of miss, you know, when I started, I, I, I loved recording on tape. I loved, I, I loved it. There was a, a warmth to it. And mm. there are plenty of, you know, there's mastering programs where you can actually, you record what you want to record. And then in the mastering program, you add this warmth element you know um still not the same there's still something about recording i mean you know one of the coolest things ever was walking out of the studio with with death trip and it was on two inch tape reels and you know it took like even though it's a short album it was like six tapes <laughs> you know six yeah, six big awesome. reels a tape. <laughs> Well, in the myth, you know, like when when Queen recorded uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, 
you know, the the myth about that, which later was, I think Brian Brian May confirmed it was that they they hit the hit the tape so many times uh, during the vocals sessions for Bohemian Rhapsody that you could actually read a newspaper through that tape. You know, two inch tapes are really thick. Yeah. So. Oh, so, so uh, went ham on it, huh? Pardon? They just put a bunch into it, like over and over again. Yeah. They through it. They well, that's it. so they you could read the newspaper through it was was the myth, and then years later, um, I think it was late eighties, early nineties. Um, they did. Uh, remastered greatest hits and you know Wayne's World had come out so I mean the the song was well all their stuff was kind of having a resurgence and then Freddie Mercury died and they they had done these remastered albums so they pulled a night at the opera out and, and we're going to remaster it and and that was when the myth was confirmed like it was it was just like held together with clear scotch tape and you could read through it so they they essentially had to to download it into a hard drive and put the masters back in the vault because they couldn't play it anymore so that's amazing yeah i i've uh i sat down with uh robbie krieger before and oh. just and he was just telling me like like I'm just not I, I don't know about these old school recordings and how they used to do it. <laughs> and use we used to use tubes and vibration. Mm -hmm. and like, Holy shit, man! I was just like an off in, in awe because I didn't I didn't know. Oh yeah, you should you should probably if it's something and not from the technological aspect of it, but uh, although you know. Bohemian Rhapsody is a, a good example because they were they were inventing they were inventing recording techniques as they went along in that song. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, if you can find information about uh, pet sounds from the Beach Boys, and I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, but then you know moved out to LA in '94, and I, I was never a Beach Boys fan. Like it, it just wasn't my thing. I was into a, a lot of other music, all types of music. And, um, but then the, the older I got and the more into recording I got, then you started reading about the genius of Brian Wilson, um, which is, you know, between that and the drugs, probably what drove him insane. <laughs> but, um, you know, he read about the Pet Sounds album because he he essentially he had recorded an album, and then um, I think it was Sergeant Pepper's came out uh, from the Beatles, and Brian Wilson scrapped the album. He he just was he just said, you know what, we can't, I can't put out this album. I have to, you know, it's got to be better because of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band from the Beatles. It's, it's mind blowing, you know. I have to do something better, and so he he recorded Pet Sounds. Now at that time, I think they only had eight track recording, you know. Which now on your computer, when you use Audacity, I mean, effectively you've got unlimited tracking. Oh yeah, you know, as long as your memory holds up, you know, and you don't have too much latency, you can just keep laying. Right like they only had eight tracks, and we're figuring that stuff out on the fly. And so they're doubling down. Uh, they're double, doubling down on some tracks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were really well, and and you know, just oh no, and you you got to try to get as much of a clean take you know you you've only got a limited number of takes before you start wearing tape and stretching tape i mean it's just fascinating but um have you ever done that with any of your albums like you have the album done and then you hear something that could influence like no i, I need my art to be better 
Well, I think I think that that's. I think that it's good to. I think it's good to compare yourself. Yeah, but I think it's also. I think you have to. <laughs> I I kind of feel. I mean. If you want to be honest about it, I kind of feel that way about death trip. I mean, it's it's just you always feel like you could have done better. And so, but the thing is, is it's been out there. It's been out there for 20 years. Um, all we can do is, is make sure, you know, from the live standpoint, we improve it, you know, in our playing or whatever, because, you know, somebody's going to record it anyway. It's going online. If you're, if you're a touring band, somebody's going to record it and put it on YouTube. So, um, essentially you could do a different take every night if you wanted to. Yeah. It's, it's such a, <laughs> that it's such a strange thing that just kind of hit me. Well, wait a minute. I mean, uh, effectively we do that, but, um, now that being said, I, I don't, and this has really kind of become, you know, more, in the vogue for artists in the last 10 years where they're taking a, a seminal piece of their history. It's like, okay, this is our best selling album. Let's re record it and put it out there. I don't understand that. I, I think that you, you have captured a moment. Yeah. And yeah. maybe you kind of relive that moment. That's yeah. I mean, place. I think if you if you go out and you play it live, I think that you you can relive that, you can recapture that every night. Whereas I, I just I think that, you know, I guess it would be like kind of trying to correct a painting after it's done. Mm -hmm. Like it's a popular painting. So, you know, remember a few years ago the the um the art restorer that screwed up the picture. I think it was a, a picture, a painting of Jesus. And I can't remember who did it, who painted it, but they were- um, I remember this, vaguely remember this in the background. Yeah, it, it just blurred everything. Yeah. That's kind of how, what I feel. <laughs> like, I, I think, I like it when an older artist covers somebody else's music or you know you try different things like that but i think re-recording your own thing is i yeah i don't know about that and i think a lot of that is for you know just making some extra cash you know which you, are gonna, you know you know you're gonna sell that yeah yeah and and that i totally get all right you talked me into it <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, and that's the thing is, you know, the music industry has changed so much. I mean, it, you know, there were, there used to be defined ways to make money. Yeah, you know, touring and merch was, um, that was more your bread and butter at the time that we started touring. And now, you know, you just constantly, you're constantly trying new things and, and new merchandise and new, you know, I mean, you know, charging, some bands charge for meet and greets, we do that. Um, I, it's such a, a strange uh, industry in that where you've, you know, everything's been about Everything's about adaptation now, where before you had a, a strategy, you know, 80% of, uh, you had this 100% of goals and you accomplished 80 of them and think some things worked and some things didn't, but then there was 20% that was just chaos and you had to adapt. Now that's all flipped and 20% of it is, okay, this is going well, and 80% is chaos. Okay, let's, A didn't work, let's try B, but here's the plan C, you know? Um, so 
Yeah, I guess, I guess well, and it certainly like for older. is way more important now. Like to have somebody yeah. in your in your management, like to to be smart, to be innovative, to be creative with uh, how to generate money for the for the band. Yeah, well, and and I think you have to be, you know, managers always knew. They may not have necessarily understood the management and the booking aspects, and you know, then accounting and everything but now that's kind of you know your manager kind of old school managers don't i don't know that they really exist anymore mm -hmm. that was when we hooked up with andy gould andy gould was an old school manager and and he did he would just he had no problem going to people and saying okay do your job my yeah. band's doing their job I'm doing mine. You need to do yours. Um, now, you know, I think that, you know, managers kind of got to know a little bit of everything. Like, mm -hmm. okay, here's my legal, while they may not necessarily be a lawyer, they, they instantly know, okay. The rules, the laws. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The jack of so, all the master of none. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what a weird world we live in <laughs> i guess if it was uh straightforward and explainable then it'd be boring uh, um i want to get into your the single that you have out right now mm -hmm. um, um dead souls is that what it's called yeah, my my freaking notes are all over the place. Like, yeah, don't worry about it. Some shit everywhere. Um, <laughs> when I heard that song, I instantly got transported back to my childhood. Um, within minutes uh, or seconds, and like we would write literally. Me and my buddies would ride around uh, with Static X in the car. <laughs> uh, three o'clock in the morning, just being stupid, you know, being kids. Um, and it, it instantly brought me back there. Um, my, I guess my question is, is this sort of like a goodbye or, or a closure for the band? No, I, I mean, no. You know, that was one of the songs that was a, that was a Wayne demo. Um, and we had a guitar part. Um, and all the guitar part was, was just that open part in the verses. We had Wayne's vocal and a, a, some dr and drum program. Very, very simple drum program. Um, and so, when I got it, you know, um, I really just focused on a couple of different drum ideas, but the, the thing that caught me, there were a couple of songs that really caught me off guard and, um, uh, Dead Souls was one and the other one was worth dying for. And, and I'll explain why in a minute, but, uh, Dead Souls to me, kind of had a feel like you know i i joined wayne's little goth band in in the fall of 1988 and he sang and while dead dead souls was was harsh um it kind of reminded me of what he sounded like in 1988 you know um it I'll, I'll tell you, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, I, where it, it feels like a goodbye, mm -hmm. um, just because I, I felt that way. I love what the song is and what, you know, what it became and the ideas that, you know, I, I, I did, a, all Rick had me do a couple of different things in the studio and, and allowed me to, to try ideas and, and we just did different takes of it. And um, 
you know, Koichi did some some excellent verse on, uh, work on those on that song, and and of course Tony. But the I I feel I kind of feel the same way as you. Like it it felt like it's not necessarily goodbye for the band, but like it kind of felt like a goodbye from Wayne. Yeah, that's what that's sort yeah. of what I was getting at. Is is, uh, is maybe goodbye to Wayne and goodbye from Wayne. I, I, I think of it as a, a goodbye from Wayne. Um, the band, you know, because of, because of how well things went, I think that we felt everything's on hold now. <laughs> you know? yeah. so it's kind of weird talking about this stuff but i th i think we feel like there's a future you know oh, yeah. once once things get up and you know what um we've got some things to figure out as a band we have some ideas we have we do have some projects we're working on along with everybody's doing side projects right now but you know um You know, not being able to tour this year was like I'm. I'm not ready to say goodbye yet. I I thought I was out of it. You know, uh, prior to this, and when Wayne died, I I thought that that was it. Mm -hmm. I think that well, and Koichi said this once in an interview that the three of us did that he even even after when the band broke up in 2010 you you know and I, and I had been out of it for years at that point but until Wayne died you had a hope that <clears throat> maybe the original lineup could get back together and do something um obviously that wasn't meant to be and and you you know certainly in you know in 2014 it just felt like it was it was done, you know, um, and there was, I mean, the, the regret of it was that, you know, Wayne died. That was, there was nothing, there was, I, I think there's some things, you know, like we probably should have taken more time off after the death trip tours and, you know, there's certain things, but they were minor things. The band was certainly, you know, if, if you would have told us 25 years ago that our debut album was going to be viewed at the, as how it's viewed now, we would have been pretty happy and shocked and, and everything. So, you know, we uh, we can look back and, and not have any regrets. That... That being said, it, about halfway through the first U.S. tour last year, it felt like I started realizing like it, it, it felt we toured for Death Trip almost three years, you know, originally. And it still felt like we weren't done. There, was, there wasn't a regret about it. There wasn't, it just felt unfinished. And um, and I think that that's how we feel now. I I certainly we feel love, that way. Like we love that. That is the introduction to you guys as artists and and, and fans. It's no one wants to do that. It, it, it earmarks part of your of a person's life, especially mine, where I was happy when there's a simpler time. Well, and it's a. It's a really unusual record. Let's yeah. face it. I mean, oh. it's it's it, it really it really is. Um, and and it was because, you know, we Wayne and I had tried for years to be a metal band, like you know, and and had tried that in Chicago. And when we first got to Los Angeles, like metal. Like, got, what do you mean, metal? Well, it's you know, I joined his goth yeah. band in '88, uh -huh. and by the time we left Chicago, we were a thrash band. 
Okay. And then, so we got to Los Angeles and, the, and that was, you know, early 94, January 94. And so, you know, Far Beyond Driven was getting ready to come out. And, and I mean, that was just such a huge album. I mean, it's, and it's just, it's just heavy as hell and just got such a groove to it, you know. But there was a there was some really interesting music coming out in ninety four, but it wasn't it was mostly alternative, you know, and it might be guitar driven. And then we got out to LA and we we played a couple of shows with glam bands in the first year and and it was and you know, I had I mean both of us had long hair, you know, and the, the band was all we were all a bunch of long hairs. And um <laughs> we played with these glam bands and it was uh, one of these bands I, I i swear i'm not being facetious about this this band i you know, i won't even mention their name or anything but they were they were they were sound checking and they had they had these texts and they weren't touring or anything but they had these texts you know and the techs were setting up fans so their hair would blow away from their face and everything. <laughs> and that was like, not too long after that was like, <laughs> screw this, I'm shaving my head. You know, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't want to, you know, we want to do guitar driven music. These guys can't play their instrument, but they've got a look. fan techs, you know, what the heck's going on. So that was the, the first step in, you know, becoming not a metal band. And, but then the, the writing process was really the next step where it was like, you know, you're playing to a click track live and we're playing this really fast music. What if we added some drum programming, you know? And, and that was it. That was the beginning of what became Death Trip. And it was really, it wasn't, some big anti-metal statement or whatever it was just we were just well we like guitar driven music but we also want girls to come to shows and maybe dance <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was it that was you know and it it became about not finding like not being like hyper aggressive or anything it became about um is this fun is this interesting you know is this noise interesting yeah <laughs> i mean we were using we did this demo of four songs and i just found it and there's part of it the opening song where it's Wayne, Wayne and I lived in this apartment at the time and we didn't have any money. So we'd just sit around and like drink beer on our nights off and, you know, splice to make these home, make these sample samples. And That's so the tape on this, right? Pardon? You're you, using tape. Uh, we, oh yeah. Oh. We didn't, have, we didn't have, there were, there were samplers available, but they were really expensive. So what we do, Wayne had a Fostex four track and a cassette deck and we would home build our, our, most of our samples with that. And then the drum machine, we had a, an Alesis HR16B, which was like a $200 drum machine. And uh, Tony and I were joking about this last week and I, cause I said, you know, I've got this nice little console for my home recording setup and you know the keyboard and everything and I'm I'm go I've got access to 11,000 sounds in this setup and I'm like I can't there's I'm going to have to go online and find the uh the $40 Alesis HR16B download because it's you know got the triangle and the hand claps and it's got puh sound like it's actually <laughs> described as p-u-h puh um, and, and but but that was the thing it was you know because we didn't have any money we were we were creative 
if you listen to Push It, and I pointed this out to people, and, and they're like, what? I never heard that. In the bridge of Push It, there's a death metal triangle. It's just a, a triangle, but it's going, it's, you know, do, 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 it's just going crazy. And that was because, you know, a couple of guys that had, hey, let's drink some beer and try some drum programs. And Wayne's like, death metal triangle. <laughs> you know, I mean, so you were like, yeah, let's try it, you know. So, I mean, it, I, you know, we had no idea what we were doing, but it was fun. And I asked Koichi, and we were scared to death. Koichi and Tony, those guys are players. Those guys, both of those guys, they can play anything. They can write anything. I mean, they're just, but um, Wayne and I were weird. <laughs> so I think we kept them interested, you know, yeah. like that was it. Um, other than that, I, we kind of really had no idea what we were doing. So it was, you know, it was just this fun experimental thing. And nothing, nothing was out of bounds. You know, it was like, you know, we recorded uh, So Real when we were in the studio. And So Real actually started off as a song called All I See So Real back in 88, 89 in Chicago. Sounded absolutely nothing like what So Real became, which was kind of this weird ambient techno dance song. And... Um, you know, ended up on the screen three of all things. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, 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 weird. What a weird time. <laughs> um, I have one last question for you. Sure. You know, I know that our time is about to run out. Um, if you can have one question answered, what would that question be? How do you get the cream filling in the Twinkies? <laughs> no, I know they inject it. Uh, no, I, I, I. The thing is, is now you now I don't know. By you asking the question, I probably had one before. <laughs> <laughs> I always. No, I, I don't. I don't know. I do. There. Are, I guess I'm, you know, I, I grew up in a town of 1,200 people, and I'm kind of an adventurous guy. And part of the joy of being adventurous is I don't have to have every question answered. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't really. My question always when I, when I, the reason why I even came up with this question is because I had so many questions that I was just looking for. And when I came up with this question, I said, this is me accepting that I'll never know everything. But the one question I always wanted to answer is, how did we start as human beings? Who was I, I just, I would love to know that for some reason that right there, it's a thirst I have. I think that You know the old saying you hear that you hear people say this oh that you know so and so was such an old soul yeah um i believe we're all old souls souls are you know the these bodies we're a these bodies are a shell everybody's got a soul and 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 they're eternal um so um Oh, gosh, now my head hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's an interesting guy. And, and I like, I like, I, I enjoy, but that's the thing is, isn't it cool that you, 
got to a point in your age where you were like, it's a cool question to have to not know the answer to. Yeah. I think that's, that's okay. That's a, that's a good one because you know, you, you get to think about it every day. And we're, you know, maybe one day we're going to find out maybe one day. Uh, oh, I think we will. Yeah. I think that, we will. That's, I think the, how human beings came to be is a beautiful story that, that we, I would love to know. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be, I mean, you know, history on its own is such a fascinating subject. Oh, I love it. I love it. Seems, seems to be, uh, in recent times, seems to be going by the wayside a little, which is disappointing. Um, that's in, uh, oddly enough, I was watching, uh, before I got online, I was watching a documentary on the space race. Ooh. And, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated with this stuff. Well, and you're, uh, you're in Southern California. I forgot mm -hmm. to ask you where you were. So, Ventura. well, and you know, so Southern California is car culture. I'm in, I'm 90 miles away from Indianapolis. So during the lockdowns, I was reading, you know, the, the start of racing season got delayed. That really bummed me out because I'm yeah. a, I love racing and, and car culture and everything. So I've been going back. I have a stack of old books that have to do with Indy and Formula One racing and, and Southern California drag racing. And, um, and the it's valley is getting real tough right now with the, the there's in, in the Valley in Los Angeles, everyone, it seems like that's a new thing. It's car racing. Uh, yeah. Uh, street racing illegally, but yeah, well, yeah. and 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 that's the thing is, you know, California has always been. When I when I lived out there, I loved the fact that, you know, by the racetrack in Fontana, you could go down and for forty bucks, uh, you know, the the state police would inspect your car. You know, CHP would have a couple of guys there, and you could run on the drag strip and everything. Mm -hmm that was such a great idea and i thought that the more people should do that but i think you know how it is is because uh, hey man i was a dumb kid and and i live in a area <clears throat> where there's usually six to uh eight miles in between towns so you're looking at a lot of two-lane country road in in farmland and um i mean you know you drive fast i mean that's just you know if you're out in the country and but but yeah it's kind of gotten more of a thing now where just people do that do that constantly um yeah in southern california r really I'm trying to think of when that took off, like the street thing, street racing. 2001. There's a lot of them. Maybe yeah, that's true. Between 99 and 2001, that's when I just, somewhere in that middle, um, that's when I noticed it. And I mean, even myself, I had a 1991 fucking uh, 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 eclipse. I souped up and I thought I was mad rice rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have it stanced? Uh, no, I was, you, there... I, I had my, my boys, everyone I had surrounded myself with, they were, they had their cars fucking stocked. Mine was just yeah. like sort of stocked. I had dual, I had cams, I had a, a cold air intake, a nice exhaust, some NOS in it. That's it. Well, and that's, you know, that's doing your research and doing the work. Um, you know, uh, probably about right before I left California, I left, uh, I moved back here at the beginning of 2010. And um, really about 2007, 2008 was when like stancing cars yeah. became a thing, you know? 
Yeah. I remember San Diego, like the cops around San Diego were pulling guys over and, you know, they were measuring from the bumper to the ground and, and also measuring camber on the tires. Like they actually wrote into law, like there was, you know, if your car is stanced past a certain point, you're probably going to lose okay. your steering, you know? Um, I mean, but, right, even right now, they're just taking people's cars. If you are fucking around on the, you know, uh, in, in the valley on the on the strip, they're gonna get you. Oh man! Well, and see, I'm not. I'm all for throwing people in jail for a couple of days over that. You know, mm -hmm. so that's kind of a learn your lesson type thing. Hopefully, of course. Then again, if there's a lot of money on it, you know. Yeah. I don't know how how illegal they're doing it. If they're just doing the racing or. If there's, I would imagine there's bets. They're just taking the car. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's a hundred or well, people running up on each other on the light and they look at you. Yeah. Cause I had a, I was driving around 2012 Mustang convertible 50 year anniversary for ever. And anytime I would hit a light, someone thinks that they want, I want to race. I'm not trying to race, you know, I just <laughs> have to you, you need to, you need to interview me again. We'll talk about cars because the last six years I was in California, I was a test driver. Oh, no shit. That's dope. Oh, no, you're breaking up a little bit. Oh, hey, I'm back. Yeah. Hey, that's uh, really yeah. Awesome. yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was a safety engineering company, but we, we dealt with, um, dealt with the manufacturers and I'm a motorcycle rider and uh -huh. I, I have a, a Ducati monster. Oh, yeah. And the German engineers love that. So I test drove, you know, Mercedes AMG and Porsche. And I, yeah. just, I mean, and it was prototype stuff. I'd drive it on the street. And uh, the German engineers were smart. They would use just older bodies and not camouflage the cars. Oh. But I, I test drove for Acura one time and the car was totally camouflaged. And there were people, I mean, there were, you know, people would pull up next to me all the time and want to race because it was, it was an Acura, you know, <laughs> the best jobs ever of all time. I, well, and not only when I was in my early twenties, I was a, a manager at a toy store. <laughs> and then in my thirties, you know, before the, right before the band got signed, I was a manager at the Virgin mega store and in, in on Hollywood Boulevard though, which was the largest record store in the world at that time yeah i've had I've, I've had a great life when it <laughs> yeah that's a i remember that store it's just sad that those stores are just not around no more like where yeah. music. remember oh. music? i used to save up my 15 dollars and 50 cents for my allowance yeah uh -huh. go all the way you know drive ride my bike seven miles and then drive home just to get a Rob Zombie CD or, you know. <laughs> well, and I don't know if you, are you old enough to remember LPs? Uh, yeah, I am. Yeah. Well, and see that, that was when I started working in record stores was really the last two years of there being vinyl. Uh -huh. um, but they were phasing it out. And, and so, you know, I just remember, I got to buy that, you know, or I get, you know, I use the uh, employee discount quite a bit <laughs> when it was final. Yeah. I don't, I, I think that, well, and I think that younger people are starting to see, you're seeing, you know, a couple of years ago, there was this weird thing where like eight tracks and cassettes. A little bit, yeah. which is, is weird to me. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's cool, and I, I don't think it's so much because the audio quality was so great. I just think that it was like, while streaming is cool and it's this instant thing, and you know I love YouTube and all the streaming services and everything. Having that hard copy of something, so watch something, hold it in your hand. Yeah, it's substantial and. You know, it's and you used to get stickers inside of them. Oh, Remember well, the and that's a you know, I'm a I'm a 
I was born in the 60s, and so, you know, growing up in the 70s, being a KISS fan, you got temporary tattoos, and for the Love Gun album, they had this kind of car- little cardboard Love Gun, mm-hmm. and uh, it's you shot it like that, and the it paper pops. would flip out, and it would pop, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and there was always posters and, you know, they would send a merchandising sheet in the vinyl and you could, like, yeah, that stuff was, it away. no, oh, it was so cool. And so that, cool. Like for some, I think the, for the mystique of a, of an artist, it's, that's gone away, you know, like you can, if you want to fall in love with the artist, you just go online, you can fall in love in 20 minutes and that's it. But mm-hmm. it was, back in the day it it was a gradual love you know yeah well and more appreciation for for what those people did now well and that's kind of you know some of it's societal the instant gratification thing and i get it it's like well i don't want to waste the money that was a big thing when i was working at record stores in the early 90s was You know, we had to install listening stations because uh, you were really seeing a huge explosion of music coming out every year and, and, you know, cassette singles were a thing and CD singles and remixes and all this stuff was becoming popular and people, people were like, well, and the other thing I remember I can't, I can't remember who the artist was, but I remember there was a, a CD that came out that was, it was 73 minutes long and it had, but it only had three singles on it. Like the rest of it was, oh, yeah, it, it was bad. <laughs> and I just remember, you know, we would sell 40, 50 of these CDs a day. And 25 people would come back and go, man, I want, I want my money back. This is a bad album. Um, you know, that, that's kind of the good thing that you can check it out. But I, I like the physical, I like that physical thing. I like holding it. I don't know. I, it's weird. <laughs> it seems like also back in those times when you're searching for music, it was a different journey than it is now. Yeah. Because now music finds you, you don't find music. Yeah. When I was a kid, you had to find music because music's not gonna find you. Well, and, and it's certainly, that was at a time when record labels developed artists. Mm-hmm. You know, there was, I mean, there were, they had a branch that just developed bands. They would sign bands to development deals. Publishers would sign bands to development deals and and that's not really a thing now yeah <laughs> you know well, and, and you, everyone to, to do their own development through tiktok or through instagram or whatever soundcloud well in, in a sense it's more organic that mm-hmm. way because the artist is doing the development but to me it seems like not that you need to go back to marketing and and everybody and you know pr people and find out you know okay what's our next step in this development but you know certainly from a a artistic standpoint um in a sense it felt like you grew up with the band yes or you you matured with the band um and now it's you know you see um you know younger artists and and it's almost it's this highly polished thing and they're younger but maybe it doesn't necessarily evolve i guess i don't know i, I you yeah, know we're right. still you're you're right on the mark because that's what i, I mean <clears throat> I, I deal with a lot of um, local talent. Uh, mm-hmm. I book a lot of shows and I, you know, I have this magazine and that's what I'm seeing as well. I'm seeing a lot of uh, the younger talent not really knowing what to do past a certain thing or, 
or they go on the off the deep end and start yeah. saying because they're not getting the amount of attention that they feel they deserve or something well and that's the thing is you know nobody uh, maybe you know when i'm off tour i do my interviews and what have you but you know i really when i was younger um although i mean i was you know 30 31 years old when static got signed wayne was a year older than me koichi's a year younger um you have that battle of you know when i was a teenager and in my early 20s and in bands i was in cover bands and i thought i was a rock star <laughs> you know? and so <laughs> well and the, the plus to that other than the fact that i was a damn fool um and acted like a damn fool uh i got it out of my system so by the time static actually got signed it was you know not turning for me it wasn't turning to drugs and alcohol it was like well i think it's time to go buy a motorcycle and then after that it was like well my backyard needs work and i know how to do a little bit of landscaping and maybe I need to buy a chainsaw, you know, like, um, I wasn't seeking impulse bias. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I just, either. I'm, I'm, it wasn't, it seems that there's a time and a place where you can separate it where, and, and it's not my identity, but it's this really cool thing that I do. But I think that the, younger people see it as their identity so much that you know they also don't understand is you know it's kind of a fickle industry in the sense that it can be gone tomorrow yeah you know it can it can just be be done and people are like well they and were, we're really good a while ago right now we're almost in, in that lifestyle yeah. Where it, it might be the music we know, uh, it might be done, and it might this might be the new music through uh, online virtually. I yeah yeah I mean yeah the last few months have changed everything, and that's kind of I I feel that makes me really sad for bands just simply because, and we got I think the industry. You know, if anybody's got any good ideas, let us know, because we've got to figure out the live thing. You know, uh, we need to be safe about it. We need to watch out for each other. And obviously this virus is, it mutates so weird, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the touring experience is such a, a unique thing. It's such a, it's communal you know and not just for the the fans but for the band but there is also the the economic impact of it yeah. is you know it's not just bands and fans and that's the economy of it it's you know bus drivers truck drivers um Warehouse. vendors yeah i mean you know parking attendants mm -hmm. of venue workers i mean there's so much that goes security i mean there's so much of this little economy that needs to be figured out but but we need to we need to figure that out if everybody's got to wear hazmat suits and you know then you can have a pit sure it'd be weird looking you know have you seen the the concerts in your car i i i like them I'd like to see a mosh pit with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to one and um, I just don't see how, you know, these promoters and the artists are getting paid because there's not enough people. And so it's, that's it, Yeah. Well, and it, it's still, man, the live things while, where it's at. I, I enjoy the process of writing and, and bouncing ideas off the guys and everything, but there's just something visceral about, you know, when we announced this whole reunion thing, 
everything, there was doubt. I mean, there was, you know, I was 52 years old when we announced this thing, 50, 51. And the whole plan was, you know, we were going to start, I was going to be 52. And within the first month, month of touring, I turned 53. And so I really, uh, you know, I psyched myself up and I trained and I really worked out really hard. And, and then within 15 seconds of, but I mean, there was still doubt there. And then once we got in the practice space, just Tony and Koichi and I, we played, we started the set, you know, we played blood for days for about 15 seconds. And I looked up, I was like, doubt's gone you know yeah. we're going to be fine like and that's what it comes down to is it, it's still that's something that's never going to change about the music industry for for everything that we've talked about and how strange the media is and in uh that it's the songs are played on and and how um you know reporting is done on it and it, it just everything about the music industry and it still comes down you know that live aspect is still it's still up here man it's still you know if if you're a good live band that's still where it's at when you're when you're that age and you're going on tour like are you is it tiring uh well, just being this age is tiring. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, the good thing about it is, uh, you know, I'm a truck driver's kid, so you put me in a tour bus with a nice bunk, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll sleep, you know? Um, and plus, you're, you know, you're physically wearing yourself out, but the, you know, the weird thing about it was I was in better shape at, 53 than I was at 34 oh. you know um I do a lot of training I work out every day and and uh you know I I feel pretty good and and so yeah it was tiring um it just you know we we had breaks in between the tours we did last year mm -hmm. but when we were on tour like you know, in the winter tour, there was, I think there was a, a 12 day run of uh, shows every day. We had a day off and then it was 13 shows in a row. That's tough. That's, you know, you physically, I was. Do you make a list make... like when you're coming back, like, oh, I want to do this again, or I want to do that, or I'm going to do this instead of like, do you make like a uh, un unwritten rules or or uh, wants that you want to do before um you know before you go on tour again no i mean you know physically i have to be you just have to be very concerned about <clears throat> you know what you can do physically and but even when i was younger i mean you know, we played, we did so much outdoor stuff when we were younger that, and it was always just stinking hot. So you learn how to pace yourself. But, you know, un unfortunately, when I was younger, um, I played everything as hard as I possibly could. I knew that my drums were mic'd up and, but it just like everything I did, I was, you know just using hammers you know yeah. so um but now you know for for years after i was out of the band after i moved, I, was, I started in los angeles uh, actually when i was test driving um i taught drums oh sure yeah and and what i noticed was you know the drummer's big battle throughout from the time you start playing to the end of your drumming life is to get more relaxed you know to to not have as much everything's flowing in this it's a really instead of driving nails it's more like cracking a whip you know yeah and um 
that was, you know, the physiotomy of, of drumming became a really important thing. So I understood about the pacing, but then from teaching, um, you know, it made me, it made me a better drummer and, it, and, uh, and I understood the pacing aspect. So, I mean, physically it wasn't demanding to me, but, um, I mean, it's, it's rough. It is just rough no, no matter how you look at it. But it, I mean, going out there and, and playing every night. And just, hurting yourself every single night. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you deal, you know, you deal with, I remember uh, Tony sprained his ankle early on in the winter tour. And, uh, there, you know, there was concern, is, is something torn, is something broken? But then, you know, after, a, because we do, you know, pace ourselves better and not, uh, you know, you're just more aware, you're, you may not be able to keep yourself from getting injured, but you're more aware of it. And you know how much a, a leave to take on a nightly basis to, <laughs> <laughs> to help you sleep. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> uh, Jay, I just want to say thank you, man. I am, or, um, I'm just super grateful. Uh, I had a great conversation with you and, well, thank you. A, uh, this this has been my pleasure, man. Don't ever, don't cut yourself short. That's, uh, I think, you know, we're, as a band, we're just kind of honored and humbled that people w still want to see us. And, you know, it's, it's just this exciting thing for us again. And we enjoy talking to you, man. <laughs> well, hopefully there's another interview in the future and we will, we'll talk some some cars next time. Uh, yeah, I got to talk about this Mustang GT ad. I want to hear more about that. It, it was, uh, my kids hated it. <laughs> and everyone knew when I was home, but. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was awesome. That was yeah. my dream car. It, and then, oh. it, um, you know, then you know how you said, then you look at your backyard and realize, oh, maybe I need to fix up my backyard or buy a chain. <laughs> That's I. I really want a new bullet Mustang, really bad. I, I passed one on the interstate a couple of weeks ago. My gosh, that's a beautiful car. Well, I know my. Um, um, I have a I have a lawnmower I need to fix up right now, <laughs> <laughs> so my down payment is probably shot. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna hope for my crypto to hit. <laughs> That's it. That's what I gotta do. <laughs> XRP, man. <laughs> um, All right. Well, Ken, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for everything, and um, we'll see. We'll see you soon, man. All right, man. Let's hope. Uh, hope so. Stay safe out there. Uh, you guys are dealing with a lot. We'll we'll keep you in a, a thoughts and prayers now. All right, buddy. Have a good one. You too, man. All right, bye bye.